guess that means me. Uh, well, let's see, I left the message here. I've got some, some slides coming here. And uh, I was talking to the uh, Washington, D.C. people yesterday. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to thank Eric for just a wonderful program here. And Brian May and uh, all the astronauts that came here and all that didn't come. And a beautiful film uh, last night. I'm going to talk about uh, not the run of the mill, not the ordinary plan that NASA has in mind. So it's going to be a little bit uncertain. Uh, I had wanted to uh, use a slide from the CERN, and I'll have to use my head, my hand here, because it, it went around this way, and I wanted it to go around this way. <laughs> so if you can imagine an ellipse flattened at the bottom and flattened at the top, and it's going this way, and the Earth is going this way. But the Earth is going faster. Now the moon, I, for convenience, put above this ellipse that is traveling. And it's just for convenience. Now the moon, in relative to everything in space, is moving counterclockwise. Did the Swiss hear that? <laughs> Counterclockwise. Maybe they were in the southern hemisphere. So this way, looking down, is called posigrade. And this way is retrograde. You hear that, Omega? Your watches are retrograde. <laughs> and I've got all three of them here. <laughs> This is the space station, one is a formal, and one is the beautiful watch that I received yesterday, along with the other uh, Stephen Hawking. I said a few words uh, last night about Stephen, and he is certainly one of those pioneers, like some other people from New Jersey. Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, Frank Sinatra, <laughs> uh, Yogi Berra. I had Yogi introduce me, and he said a few words, and he says, now, now this guy is the smartest astronaut I know. So I came up to receive the word, and I walked by Yogi, and I said, Yogi, how many astronauts do you know? <laughs> well, I'm not thinking. <laughs> I'm a very proud uh, person from New Jersey, and uh, I want to try and go through. Oh, there we go. I've got a slide in front of me there. Uh, so, why go to the moon? Well, we're going to establish leadership strategically, do a lot of technological, and uh, we're going to do a whole lot of things. Now, the Artemis program, the twin sister of Apollo, twin sister. And I thought Apollo was a warrior. Oh well. <laughs> the path to the moon is NASA's program. And the way to the moon is by the, the gateway. Now the gateway is something that's not at the moon, 
it's a ways away, uh, sort of on the far side, and, and it goes around in seven days. Now, in orbit around the moon, we were two hours. Now, this orbit uh, is very high. At its low point, is a thousand kilometers. So that's, at the low point, that's going fast. Now, to get a lander from there down to the surface, it takes a three-stage lander. Why is the gateway there? I can't say a whole lot about the progress in the last 50 years. Saturn V took the command module, the lunar module, three of us to the moon. We landed, explored, lifted off, rendezvous, came back here. So now we've got SLS and Orion. Now SLS gets its propulsion from the shuttle, and then it became Ares V. Well, Ares V couldn't lift Orion, so we took the fuel out of it. That wasn't enough, so we put five segment solids in it, and they vibrated too much. And so we canceled Ares I, and the lander, and uh, Orion had to get a new engine on the back, so we went to the Europeans to give us a service module. Uh, it's still pretty heavy, and Orion and SLS, believe it or not, cannot get to the moon with any maneuver capability. Wow, what progress we've made in 50 years. That is why my program is called Next Step Space Alliance. That alliance consists of NASA, ESA, Russia, Japan, China, ULA, a monopoly of Boeing and, and Lockheed, SpaceX, and Blue Origin. Those are eight capable uh, entities that can make up space exploration. Now, in Earth orbit, we have joined things before. In the Gemini program, we had an Agena up there, and we joined the Gemini with a human in it. Now we have the ISS up there, but we sent supply craft up there. Sure, we got people in here, but it's an unmanned activity. So I, need, I see nothing complex about joining <coughs> through two things in low Earth orbit and then putting them together and it goes somewhere further than SLS could take us. I see nothing that couldn't go from orbit to orbit and then back to orbit without a heat shield and without entry, without all the abort, it's a transfer craft from, it's T-O-R, Transway, not Gateway, Transway Orbital Rendezvous, going with Earth Orbit Rendezvous, and my my uh, role model, John Hubold, who developed the process of lunar orbit rendezvous in competition with Werner von Braun, who used big rockets, two Saturn Vs, to take a big spacecraft all the way to the moon, and it would do everything, and then come back. But John Hubold said, no, oh, you can use one Saturn V, but you take two spacecraft, and, and that's how the Apollo program worked. So, remember 
the father of the Apollo program was John Hubel. Now, just by coincidence, he came up with that little orbit rendezvous right around the end of 62 and the beginning of 63. When did I leave MIT to go to the Air Force? The end of 62, the beginning of 63. I had completed my thesis on concentric orbit rendezvous which we used in Germany with lunar orbit rendezvous and Apollo and lunar orbit rendezvous. So I feel like I sort of helped give birth to lunar orbit rendezvous. So now, France way one orbit rendezvous goes from one orbit to another. Not just low Earth orbit to lunar orbit, but low Earth orbit to a lunar cruiser or a Mars cruiser. A lunar cruiser is pretty interesting. We used to call it a cycling. What it does is it goes around the Earth and goes out past lunar orbit on a 20-day orbit comes back, then does a figure eight around the moon, going positive grade around the moon, coming back, and then uh, retrograde around the moon, then coming back and positive grade, uh, and then it completes another 20-day orbit. Now that's long duration. That's a tourist orbit, too. When you get out to the end of a 20-day orbit, if we, and we would, raise the perigee above the radiation belts. Now, you go through the radiation belts once on the transcraft and once coming back through. But if the perigee is above the radiation belts, then long-duration crews can be there one month, five months, seven months, and they only go through radiation belts twice. So they can do all the orbital stuff that the Gateway can do. Data from the Gateway close to the moon. And I forget it, we've got satellites going around the moon. We've got relay stations. The data goes to a relay station, comes back to Earth. Why put a person out there? He doesn't need to mess up that data. Why put anybody out there in a fixed orbit? Like lunar orbit? Like Earth orbit? Now, we'll put a space station out there to, to do science and other things. But for transportation, we don't need anything permanently in Earth orbit or in lunar orbit. Now, a transcraft comes back from the moon, uses propulsion initially, Yeah, I'm doing that wrong for you guys. Um, it goes this way out to the moon, then it comes back this way. And it will use propulsion to get back into low Earth orbit. Now, if we wanted to use that expensive Orion, we could come back from the moon direct, make an entry but I'm not relying on SLS or Orion. So the transfer craft can really have uh, the first three or four components of the gateway, except we combine them in a team. Now we have two teams and three teams, so they can use the same elements if they want, 
but we got three teams and we'll pick the best one for the first time we use something and then the second and then the third. Now in addition to the transcraft, we have one other option. The ISS is getting old. 18, 19 years old. Well, three to four billion dollars a year, people want to keep it going until 2030. We can't go anywhere if we keep paying for that station that long. We've got to privatize it. And you can't find anyone that wants to pay that much for the ISS. So you have to create labs, small labs, using those first three elements of the gateway in a company called Axiom or Bigelow, or both. Now, both of those would love to go to the space station. They claim they can be self-sustaining by themselves. They want to lean on the, the space station for life support, propulsion, all these other things, supply. Guess who pays for it? American taxpayer or the governments, the international governments. We need to privatize things with something that comes from the commercial sector, can afford to build the facilities, then get the people, commercial people who want to do the experiments. Now there are three needs that I see. One is the normal uh, science, technology, research. And that'd be the one laboratory we want to do first, so we could get Axiom and uh, Bigelow there. Then the second is pretty easy, it's microgravity. Nobody's there most of the time. A guy goes over and visits her gown, turns some dials, throws some switches, uh, put some supplies in and comes back absolutely still. You cannot do that at the ISS. Now the third laboratory, co-orbiting, is a little bit more complex. It needs a, uh, a bigger solar array and a bigger habitat so it'll point at the sun, spin stabilized, but then it can rotate and deploy uh, modules out for centrifugal force or artificial gravity. You can't do that at the ISS. So you either put laboratories or you go to the moon with transfer craft on a concept called Transway that connects Earth orbit rendezvous T-O-R, Transway Orbit Rendezvous, with Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. When the transcraft gets to the moon, the lander is up there, they exchange crews, the one goes down, the old one comes back, the transfer craft comes back to low Earth orbit. It can use aero caption to save some fuel. Not the whole transfer craft, but just the, the crew container part. The other part can use a very efficient solar electric propulsion, whereas high thrust to leave, low thrust most of the journey, then high thrust to enter. Now we deliver cargo with the same thing, high thrust then low thrust, then high thrust. Now the reason the high thrust at both ends is to avoid this spiraling outward, which consumes a lot of time. Uh, so I tried to explain lunar orbit. Now how did the gateway get there? Two assumptions. One was got water on the moon, we can send water out, 
use the sun to convert it to fuel. Fuel is 90% maybe of what's going to go to Mars. So we'll send the spacecraft that's going to go to Mars out there. Then some people said, well, we're high in the gravity well, away from Earth, let's just thrust and go to Mars. Now, astrodynamics people, Bob Parkour and others, said, uh, well, you want to add energy to an orbit? Get the most out of it? You do it when the velocity is high. Well, it's pretty low out by the moon, but if you leave the moon and swing by the Earth, that's where you add the energy. Now, knowing that, I wasn't that mature, and I don't think other people were, because they were so focused on this refueling out there. And a depot. Well, why don't you bring the fuel back to Earth orbit? Then there's no depot there. Instead of sending the spacecraft out there, and then the crew after you refuel it, put the spacecraft out in Earth orbit, refuel it from the moon, the tanker goes back, the crew gets in and off it goes. Nothing remains. Because the next time you go to the moon, it's a different. Next time you go to Mars, it's a different orbit. So that was an assumption that led to a gateway as a departure point for the moon. First it was for Mars, and then we're not doing journey to Mars, we're going to go to the moon on the way. So the gateway started coming in closer and closer. And it was a lunar orbit platform gateway, so now it's just a plain gateway in the orbit. This is not very close to the moon because Orion can't get there. That's not progress in my mind. Now the other assumption is, oh, to go anywhere, you leave Earth in a rocket, and you have to be able to abort from that. To come back, you need a heat shield. Uh, maybe we need a way station in low Earth orbit. Maybe we need a way station in lunar orbit. The lander will come up. It'll meet something that came some, somewhere else. They'll sit there for a while, wave at each other, tell a couple of jokes. Then the new crew goes down, the old crew comes back, and the way station stays there. Just like the way station around the Earth. Could be the space station. This one at the moon could be a depot. Wrong. We do not need a way station around the moon. We do not need a way station for transportation around the, uh, well, from orbitory. We'll use the space station for laboratory work. It has nothing to do with transportation uh, going somewhere else, just up and down. Uh, by the same token, we don't need a way station around Mars. We've got something convenient. There's a moon around Mars called Phobos. And we would kind of like to go to it. So we can have a Mars cruiser that swings by the Earth, the Transway Orbit Rendezvous craft, joins up with it, goes along. When it gets to Mars, it can get off aero capture out to uh, Phobos. Get into orbit around Phobos. We've got a uh, Phobos cruiser. Just goes around Phobos. It's at the moon, it's called a, a DRO, Distant Retrograde Orbit. 
Now, how many people can tell me what the heck a distant retrograde orbit is? I just gave you a clue. Everything is distant. Everything is in orbit. Retrograde, you know, goes like a clock. Well, this is something that goes like a clock. Am I doing this right for you? Yeah. It's got to be obvious. Now, you have something in orbit, something else in orbit can do that. It's a two by one ellipse. You combine that with catching up or departing and you get an asteroid. I had to learn a bunch of that stuff the hard way. So lunar orbit, we don't need too much. Lunar surface, we can go with the cargo. Long duration mission. Long duration coming back. And all of these principles apply to Mars. It takes a little deep thinking and I haven't got a university yet to really understand the flyby of Mars. Now, the flyby of the Moon is going to go clockwise for me, but counterclockwise. So it's going to go out like this and then go around the moon like that. And a figure eight. And I'll leave it up to you people to try and tell me why it goes in a figure eight. But just so happens that Mars does the same thing, even though it departs Earth on an Earth trajectory and it's on a hunt sun trajectory, when it gets to Mars, it's on a Mars trajectory. So it's a little more complex. But you're still going to approach Mars in a way that is not going to be convenient for you to get. I may be doing this backward for you. But, but you want to get in a Hosgrade orbit, because that's the way Mars rotates, that's the way the moon goes around it. But you're going by this way, so uh, forget it. You're going the wrong way, so you get off here, you're you're going to be going the wrong way. So it takes it takes some enabling. You can't just throw it at a computer and expect uh, the right thing to come out. You've got to ask somebody like me. I don't know all the time. Uh, the Artemis program, going to get to the South Pole. Why? Because that's where more of the ice is on the far side of the South Pole. Uh, probably going to send three, two people, male, female. Uh, and uh, I'm not counting on the SLS and Orion. We can do it. We can bring it, take Orion out and bring it back. Uh, but I think we can get a HAB module that can go up and down. Commercial crew goes up, joins the uh, transfer craft, unloads the people. Old crew comes off, new crew gets on, transfer craft goes up. We don't need Orion to come back and penetrate the atmosphere. Uh, we just need radiation protection on it. Um, we need to save money from the ISS where we can. And we need to spend the money wisely and not go over budget spending money on SLS and Orion. 
if I, if it were my way, as long as they've been working on SLS and Orion with the unmanned mission EM-1, I'd give them an ultimatum. Right now, it's scheduled maybe early in 2020, probably. I'd say, you got to launch that in 2020, 9-11. Everybody can remember that date. This happens to be about a month and a half before re-election, too. <laughs> you know I bring politics into here somewhere. Now, this shows you how Ryan launched with SLS uh, can go up and take various things up to the gateway. First, we want to land unmanned uh, robots on the moon, scout it out, look for where the water is, where we want to establish the base, and in my downrange thinking, we want to look at Mars. Where do we want the base to be at Mars? Then find the place at the moon. It's very similar. Because if we find water at the moon, with a nuclear reactor, we can turn that into fuel. Now we can refuel on the surface. With people? No. From mission control. We make it a routine operation from the depot to the refueling location. If we do that from mission control. We can do that to Mars, too. Just think how much money we save and how many landers we would save by refueling those landers. Now, if we do it the same way and we use oxygen hydrogen at the moon, I think we should use oxygen and hydrogen at Mars. But there's much more ice at Mars than there is at the moon. Who cares if we have too much carbon dioxide at Mars? Not me. <laughs> Not very good to breathe, but eventually it'll get warmer and warmer there, I think. At least so a lot of you guys tell me. Uh, now, this goes to uh, Artemis 1, 2, and 3. 3 is the first crew that's uh, going to land on the moon. Now, on, on my Artemis one, I to use two launches of two upper stages. A payload or a lander on one, another rocket to join up. We take a lander to the moon. It makes landing, has another landing. Next phase, we send a lander there the same way, two upper stages. But it's going to be joined by two upper stages that are going to launch go right for the transfer craft and fuel. If the transfer craft is already in orbit, it can launch additional fuel for it. So this is a dress rehearsal. And the third mission is a first landing. We get the lander there the same way. We get the half there, the transfer craft the same way, but now we got a crew in it. And we bring the crew back repulsively to Earth orbit and eventually aero capture because then we'll bring the transfer craft back in a uh, high thrust, low thrust, high thrust to save fuel, and it'll come back a couple of months after the crew comes back in the um, air capture. Now the air capture vehicle I'm working with, Langley and Colorado and heat resistant people, guess what it's going to be called? 
the buzz craft. <laughs> uh, I think I've uh, probably exceeded my time, but I wanted you folks to get a picture of alternatives to the gateway, and I will be expounding on this transway orbit rendezvous between any orbits, a lunar cruiser, a Mars cruiser, a Phobos cruiser. So the principles, the details can be a little different. The sensors can be a little different. But the principles, and that's what we are really interested in, understanding the principles not a launch guy, surprisingly, and not a lander guy. Bill, he did all that. All I said was, contact light, engine stop. Very nice landing. And we all were very proud of that. So I'm not a landing guy, I'm not a launch guy, but I'll get you between orbits as well as anybody else can. Thank you very, very much.